The ability to destroy all the monsters your opponent controls is an extremely powerful effect that more often than not wins the game on its own, either by turning the tide of the duel by clearing the field of all your opponent's boss monsters, or by getting rid of all of your opponent's last line of defenses and ending the game more quickly. And is the reason why Regeki spent so much time on the Forbidden and Limit list. Even in the modern era, wiping your opponent's monsters of the field is a premium effect, so in this video we're going to focus on the best cards with the ability to destroy all the monsters your opponent controls. And at number 10, we have Oblis the Tormentor one of the original Egyptian god cards and only one of five divine beast type monsters in the game. Obelisk is a level 10 divine monster with 4000 attack and defense, and like the other Egyptian god cards, can't be normal summoned and requires three tributes in order to tribute someone on the field, but that normal summon can't be negated by something like Solemn Judgment. And if you try to cheat it out by special summoning it, it sends itself to the graveyard during the end phase of the turn that it was special summoned. However, if you do manage to bring Obelisk to the field in any way, it can't be targeted by card effects, including your own, and at the cost of Obelisk not being able to attack, you can tribute two monsters you control to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. So, this means that if you bring out Oblis normally, without the use of modern support like Crossing Souls, or without cards to special summon him like Monster Reborn, you're essentially using five of your own monsters in order to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Three in order to summon Oblis, and two others in order to trigger his effects. Even if you cheat out Oblis in some way, you still have to tribute two monsters you control to wipe your opponent's field making it a lot more difficult to use in setup compared to Raigeki. So, with how difficult Oblis is to use, why does it make it into the list? Well, you might be surprised to hear that Oblis the Tormentor actually saw a fair amount of competitive play during a near tier 0 format no less. You see, during Dragon Ruler format, part of why the Dragon Rulers were so powerful was not only their ability to gain advantage and special summon themselves out of the field, but also because of their toolbox of removal options. Blaster, Dragon Ruler of Infernos, and Mecha Phantom Beast Dracosac could both be used to target and destroy one card of the field, and they even had access to non-destruction removal to bypass protection in number 11 Big Eye to target and take control of one of your opponent's monsters. But you may notice that every one of these effects targets, and because Obelisk could not be targeted by card effects and had such a high attack stat, it was actually very difficult for Dragon Rulers to remove Obelisk from the field, and thus Obelisk saw a decent amount of competitive play in Dragon Ruler side decks for the mirror match. Since Dragon Rulers could easily swarm the field to provide Oblis with enough fodder to tribute for his normal summon without losing too many resources. The ability to destroy all monsters your opponent controls was also somewhat relevant, as you could wipe your opponent's field of Mecha Phantom Beast tokens in order to then destroy their Draco Sack by battle, and all you had to do was tribute two monsters you controlled, including your own Mecha Phantom Beast tokens made by Draco Sack, making Oblis' Raigeki a lot more usable than it first appears. Despite the amount of competitive play Oblis saw, it only takes number 10 spot on this list because, while its Raigeki-like effect was certainly usable, it wasn't the main reason the card saw play. It was the fact that Oblis couldn't be targeted and was a difficult card for your opponent to out, with the ability to destroy all your opponent's monsters just being icing on the cake, rather than the main appeal of the card. And at number 9, we have Mirror Force, a normal trap card whose fame rivals and arguably precedes even that of Raigeki as one of the game's most recognizable comeback cards. Mirror Force can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack, and when it's used, it destroys all attack position monsters your opponent controls. Now, there are a lot of factors which make Mirror Force worse than compared to cards like Raigeki. Not only is Mirror Force a trap card, meaning that it has to be set before it can be used, but it also only destroys attack position monsters and is conditional, only being able to be used when your opponent declares an attack, rather than at any time, which gives your opponent plenty of opportunity to remove it from the field or set up negations before entering the battle phase. Despite all of these downsides, however, Mirror Force has had such an impact on the game, it changed the way people played you. You see, attacking is the way most decks in Yu-Gi-Oh actually win the game by reducing their opponent's life points to zero. Even in the modern era, which enables a large amount of battle damage to be done to your opponent, like Borosaur Dragon or Axis Code Talker, are valuable tools which are played in order to close out games quickly, but in order to do so, they still must attack, which puts them at the mercy of Mirror Force if they can't remove it from the field before the battle phase. But during the decades in which Mirror Force saw competitive play, players would often be thinking of Mirror Force when trying to end the game. So much so that people would often switch their own monsters to defense position before the battle phase in order to play around the possibility of a Mirror Force. And at least have some resources or defenders in case their attack position monsters were destroyed. To give an idea of how influential and game determinative Mirror Force once was, it was limited on the very first TCG ban list in 2002 and remained either banned or limited until late 2012. But during those years that it was only at one copy, players would still occasionally choose to switch some of their monsters to defense position if their opponent had a set card, purely due to the possibility that it could be a force, even if it was just a bluff in an attempt to survive another turn. 
Nowadays, Mirror Force doesn't see as much play, and it's even at three copies. Its effect isn't necessarily bad, and can definitely catch an opponent off guard. However, what hurts Mirror Force, and the reason why it's only at number 9 on this list despite its influence, is because of how conditional it is in comparison to other board wipes. Because it's tied to only being able to be used on attack declaration, it can't really be used to interrupt your opponent and is often subject to removal of cards like the aforementioned Axis Kotaker or Nightmare Phoenix before it can be used. Still, due to the card's notoriety, and because of the way it made people change the way they played the game, Mirror Force absolutely deserves a spot on this list, even if it's not aged as well as the next card in this list. And making a splash in at number 8 is Elemental Hero Absolute Zero. Absolute Zero is a member of the hero archetype and is a level 8 water warrior fusion monster that requires any hero monster and any water monster as its material. It can only use special summon by fusion summon, gains 500 attack for every water monster in the field apart for itself, including water monsters on your opponent's side of the field. But the strongest effect, and the reason why it's on this list, is that if Elemental Hero Absolute Zero leaves the field at any time, it will destroy all monsters your opponent controls. This is an incredible effect, as it means that even if Absolute Hero is destroyed by battle, card effect, or banished face up, Absolute Zero will still trigger and wipe your opponent's field, making it quite difficult to deal with while keeping your field intact. In fact, prior to April 2020, Absolute Zero's effect would also trigger when it was returned to the extra deck, making it almost impossible to deal without triggering its effect. And due to how difficult Absolute Zero was to out, it saw a lot of competitive playing decks, which just so happened to play water and hero monsters that could be used for its fusion summon. Diva Hero, for example, would use Deep Sea Diva in combination with hero cards like Destiny Hero Malicious in order to set up the necessary materials for powerful level 8 synchro monsters like Goyo Guardian or Stardust Dragon with the level 2 Diva and the level 6 Malicious. Then you could use Miracle Fusion, which just so happens to be able to summon elemental heroes, to banish the Water Diva and Hero Malicious that you use for the synchro summons to make the difficult out absolute zero. Gemini Hero would also use Absolute Zero to great effect, though instead of fusing D.Va with the hero, you could use cards like Elemental Hero Ocean to fuse with the Gemini monster Elemental Hero Neos Alias, either on field polymerization or once again with Miracle Fusion after using Neos Alias for something like a Gemini Spark. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your viewpoint, the April 2020 rule revisions changed how Absolute Zero and other floating effects similar to it worked, and in the modern era it can simply be returned to the extra deck or banished face down in order to avoid the activation of its effect. But even with this nerf, many modern hero builds still play Absolute Zero to this day, as while it can be used as a way to deal with your opponent's board of boss monsters, it can also be used as interruption because it doesn't require your opponent to make Absolute Zero leave the field. It just demands that it leaves the field in any capacity. So, if you make your own Absolute Zero leave the field in some way on your opponent's turn, you essentially have a quick play Raigeki, and it just so happens hero decks have an archetypal way of doing this. By using the quick play spell Mass Change, you can send your own Absolute Zero to the graveyard to summon out Mass Hero Acid from your extra deck. Not only will this trigger Absolute Zero's effect to destroy all your opponent's monsters, it'll also trigger Mass Hero Acid's effect to destroy your opponent's back row, essentially acting as a full board wipe and not just a Raigeki. So with how useful Absolute Zero is, why does it only make it to the number 8 spot on this list? Absolute Zero's effect is incredible, however, it requires a certain amount of setup and is not as generic or easily accessible as other cards on this list such as the next card on this list which almost any deck could theoretically use. And making an even bigger splash at number 7 is Torrential Tribute, another well-known trap card that can be used as a comeback tool, though has slightly more applications than Mirror Force. Torrential Tribute is a normal trap card that has a simple effect that when a monster is summoned to the field, you can destroy all monsters on the field. Like Raigeki and Mirror Force, Torrential Tribute is a card with a storied history in competitive play, and has seen use ever since it was first released in the TCG in 2003, and is probably the card on this list that has seen the most amount of competitive play overall. It's even currently still a staple for trap-based decks like Amazement or Paleozoic, as it can act as both an interruption when going first to prevent your opponent from making their plays, or it can even be used as a powerful going second tool to clear an opponent's field of boss monsters the moment they summon another monster to try to push for lethal damage. You can just destroy every monster on the field. Torrential Tribute can even be used on your own turn if it was set on a previous turn if you summon a monster, and doesn't necessarily rely on your opponent taking an action like Mirror Force. All Torrential needs is for any monster to be summoned to the field for you to clear the board. Although, the fact Torrential Tribute is a trap card can occasionally work to its detriment since it needs a turn to be set up. However, it being a trap card usually works to the card's benefit, and it was even recently popularized once again when True King of All Calamities was legal as a way to play around not being able to use monster effects for a whole turn, as you could simply just set Torrential to wipe your opponent's board, including their True King of All Calamities. The main downside of Torrential is that it clears the whole field rather than just destroying your opponent's monsters, and as a result of that, the more monsters you have committed to the field, the less the value Torrential Tribute can gain, making it slightly weaker as a tool to push for game, 
or as interruption when you've already got your boss monster set up. However, Torrential Tribute now has a searcher in Fury of Kairishin, which not only acts as an extra three copies of Torrential by searching it, but also protects all of your water monsters from being destroyed by card effects. Which just so happens to mitigate the main downside of Torrential wiping your own field too, as you can banish Fury from your graveyard to protect your field of monsters from your own Torrential. All in all, Torrential is still an incredible piece of removal that's modular in how it can be used and is likely to continue to see play as a staple trap card for years to come, even if it can occasionally destroy your own monsters. It's just too versatile to ignore. A quirk which Torrential shares with the next card on this list. And at number 6, we have the double whammy of Dark Hole and Interrupted Kaiju Slumber. Two normal spell cards that destroy every single monster on the field. For Dark Hole, the effect ends there, but for Interrupted Kaiju Slumber, if you destroy a monster, you get to also special summon two kaiju monsters with different names from your deck to the field. One for you and one for your opponent. And you can banish Kaiju Slumber from your graveyard in order to add a kaiju monster from your deck to your hand, except during the turn that Kaiju Slumber was sent to the graveyard. The reason why both Dark Hole and Kaiju Slumber are at the same point in this list is because they both have similar effects and have seen competitive play for similar reasons, and their own particular upsides and downsides level out and put them on the same tier. At first glance, Kaiju Slumber appears to be a much stronger card, as not only are you able to clear the field, you're also able to special summon a high attack Kaiju from your deck, which can be used for Link or Xyz plays, or just as a beat stick to attack over your opponent's lower attack Kaiju. But this can also work against the card, as not only do you have to build your deck with Kaiju Slumber in mind to ensure you always have at least two Kaijus of different names in your deck at all times, it can also be stopped completely with an Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, which wouldn't just negate the spell to summon from the deck, but also the effect to destroy all monsters in the field, since they're tied to the same effect. But if Kaiju Slumber does manage to resolve, it leaves you in a very strong position. In contrast, Dark Hole doesn't special summon from the deck and only destroys monsters, which is still quite an impactful effect, especially because it can't be negated by a common staple like Ash Blossom. Furthermore, unlike Kaiju Slumber, Dark Hole also isn't once per turn. Which means that if your opponent happens to control a monster with floats into other monsters, and you have multiple Dark Holes, you can just activate Dark Hole twice in the same turn to ensure the field is clean. So, both of these cards have interesting quirks that need to be considered when adding them to your deck, but does it make one better over the other? What both of these cards do share is that, like Torrential, they also destroy all monsters on your side of the field, which can be a pretty hefty downside, as like Torrential, the more monsters you control in your field, the less value Dark Hole or Kaiju Slumber will bring you, as you'd also be losing out on your own monsters. But some decks actually use this to their advantage. In Dinosaur, for example, a deck which can easily play Kaijus like the Dinosaur-type Dogura and the Mad Flame Kaiju, and as a result, both Dark Hole and Kaiju Slumber have seen plays a tech choice that helps the deck go in first and second, as it can be used to clear your opponent's field, or more importantly, it can be used to destroy your own monsters, such as Baby Sarasaurus, which, if destroyed by a card effect, would float into a level 4 or lower Dinosaur-type monster from your deck, or a Lost World token, in order to protect what Lost World's effect to destroy a baby Cerasaurus from your deck. Other decks like Unchained or Yang Zing can also benefit in the same way, which is why Dark Hole and Kaiju Slumber both make it the number 6 spot on this list. As with some smart deck building, the biggest downside of these cards can be turned into their biggest strengths, and even be more versatile than Raigeki itself. And at number 5, we have Prank Kid's Battle Butler, a level 8 Wind Thunder type fusion monster with 3000 attack and defense, and requires Prank Kid Lampsies, Prank Kid Dropsies, and Prank Kid Fansies as materials. It could only be fusion summoned and has the non-once per turn effect, where you contribute it to destroy all monsters your opponent controls as a quick effect. And if Battle Butler is sent to the graveyard by any way by your opponent, you can target any non-fusion monster in your graveyard, even if it's not a Prank Kids monster and special summon it, with this effect being a hard once per turn. Now, being a fusion monster with three specific materials, Battle Butler may seem difficult to access at first. But because every Prank Kid has an effect to special summon out another Prank Kid from the deck whether it uses a fusion or a link material for a Prank Kids monster, Getting access to every material with Battle Butler is relatively easy, especially because both of the Prank Kid Link 2 monsters can add a Prank Kid card from the graveyard to the hand, and Doodle Doo specifically also searches Prank Kid's Pandemonium, the archetype specific fusion spell making Butler a relatively easy to access boss monster, even more so because it's Thunder type, which just so happens to make it a valid target for Thunder Dragon fusion. And the ability to use Raigeki at any point during either player's turn is insanely strong. As, like previously mentioned, Torrential Tribute, Battle Butler can be used as an interruption and as a way to clear the field. But what really drives Battle Butler over the top is Prank Kid's Meow Meow Mew. Meow Meow Mew is a Link 1 Prank Kid's monster, which means that it triggers the effects of all Prank Kids when they use as a Link material for Meow Meow, making it even easier to get Battle Butler, since you just need a single Prank Kids to Link Summon Meow. But Meow Meow also has the effect that once per turn, while it's in the graveyard during your opponent's turn, if a Prank Kid's monster would tribute itself for cost in order to activate its effect, you can banish Meow Meow Mew from your graveyard instead. 
So before Meow Meow Mew was released, Prank Kid's Battle Butler could only use its ability to wipe the field once per copy, as you would have to tribute your Battle Butler in order to activate its effect, removing it from the field. But then, as long as you can get Meow Meow into the graveyard, such as by using it as a link material, you don't just get one field wipe from Battle Butler, you get a double field wipe that can be activated at any point, making it premium disruption. In fact, Battle Butler is such a strong and consistent boss monster that Prank Kid's Meow Meow Mew recently got banned for this interaction and other broken things it could accomplish for just being a Link 1 monsters in Prank Kids as well. And the fourth best Raigeki-like effect is Raigeki itself. Raigeki is a normal spell card with the simple effect that destroys all monsters your opponent controls. A surprisingly low entry on this list, Raigeki has a lot of positive features which make the card very attractive when deck building. It's a normal spell card that can be used by any and every deck, it doesn't come with any restrictions or conditions you have to fulfill in order to use it, and doesn't destroy monsters on your side of the field, making it the premium tool in wiping your opponent's board, and is the reason why Raigeki has spent over 20 years on the Forbidden and Limited list, since destroying all monsters your opponent controls is such a versatile effect that it can be used as a going second tool or to just clear a board to push for a game. And since it's newly freed from the ban list, Raigeki is still seeing competitive play even right now in Flunderies and Sky Striker lists to just act as a free board wipe to help those decks when going second. But despite it now being at 3, and something that every deck can use, its use isn't as widespread as it once was. Part of this is due to the game's power creep, introducing boss monsters that simply don't care about Raigeki, or have some kind of inherent protection from being destroyed. But the other part is that Raigeki is purely a going second tool, and despite having no restrictions, is very restrictive in how it can be used. It can't be used as an interruption tool, such as a card like Torrential Tribute can. It's not really modular, as it can only ever destroy monsters your opponent controls, and can't be used creatively like Dark Hole, and is only ever used once per card, unlike Battle Butler. But, for the niche that Raigeki belongs to, there is no doubt that it's the best card in the game to destroy all monsters your opponent controls and respect should be thrown into Raigeki's name for that reason, especially since it's still seeing competitive play to this very day. The reason why it's only at number 4 spot is just because other cards are either more versatile, even if they're slightly more specific, or just have stronger effects. So, there are three cards in the game which have a stronger Raigeki-like effect than Raigeki, so let's see what those are. And at number 3, we have Arch Nemesis Protoss, a level 11 Dark Worm monster with 2500 attack and 3000 defense. Protoss cannot be normal summoner set, and must be special summoned by banishing three monsters from your field or graveyard with different attributes. It can't be destroyed by card effects, and its Raigeki-like effect is that on a hard once per turn, you can declare one attribute of a face-up monster in the field to destroy all monsters in the field with that attribute, and stop either player from special summoning any monsters with that declared attribute. So, at first glance, Protoss seems like a fairly strong tool to wipe your opponent's field as while it may be difficult to set up three different attributes in your graveyard, if Protoss manages to hit the field, you can simply declare an attribute of a monster your opponent controls to destroy all monsters of that attribute, and then if they just so happen to play only monsters of that attribute, you've essentially forced them to skip their next turn, which is already very strong. But what exactly makes Protoss stronger than Raigeki? Because unlike Raigeki, Protoss is also exceptionally strong when going first, as if you're able to summon Protoss on your first turn, you don't have to call an attribute that your opponent controls, and can instead just call an attribute of a monster you control, locking your opponent out of special summoning that attribute completely. So what you would often do with Protoss on the field is declare Dark Attribute, the attribute of Protoss himself, locking your opponent out of the most used attribute in the game, which is host in a lot of popular decks like Phantom Knights and powerful generic boss monsters like Nightmare Unicorn or Borlode Savage Dragon, and it also can't be destroyed by card effects, giving the added bonus that you get to keep your own Protoss after you declare Dark. Now, despite this very powerful effect, Protoss didn't really see too much play for a while, and was often looked upon as strong, but inconsistent and hard to use as a win condition, since setting up all the right attributes in the graveyard could be difficult, and the card was hard to search. However, when Sword Soul was released, they could not only easily provide three attributes in the graveyard to easily summon Protoss, they could also search any worm from their deck using their archetypal search spell, Sword Soul Emergence, provided they controlled a synchro monster which Sword Soul is quite proficient at bringing out. And it just so happens that Protoss was the perfect storm of type and attribute, being a Dark Worm that Sword Soul players could search to floodgate their opponent out of the game, sometimes completely if they're playing a Dark deck, winning games on its own. This Raigeki-like effect was so strong and easily accessible that Protoss itself was soon banned following the release of Sword Soul, and wide earns a number 3 spot on this list, even above Raigeki itself. Being able to declare and prevent your opponent from summoning an attribute is just too strong, especially when Sword Soul has access to many different attributes it can bring out to the field to lock out other decks, even if it does destroy their own cards, making it versatile and difficult to play around, just like the next card on this list. 
And at number two, we have Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon, the third fusion monster on this list and the second worm. Mirror Jade has 3,000 attack and defense and requires Fallen of Albaz in any fusion, synchro, axes, or link monster as its material. You can only ever control one of it, and on a quick effect that's a soft once per turn, you can send a fusion monster that lists Fallen of Albaz as its material from your extra deck to the graveyard, including another copy of itself, to banish any card in the field without targeting. But this comes to the downside that if you use the effect, that specific copy of Mirror Jade can't use that effect during the next turn. All of this is already a pretty powerful effect, since it allows Mirror Jade to act as both disruption and as a way to deal with problem boss monsters, especially those that can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects. And the icing on the cake is Mirror Jade's second effect. If Mirror Jade is removed from the field by your opponent in any way while you control it, other than be banishing face down and return to the extra deck, you can trigger Mirror Jade's second effect to destroy all monsters your opponent controls during the end phase of this turn. Initially, this effect may appear to be a much worse version of Elemental Hero Absolute Zero, as it can't be used to clear your opponent's board immediately after being dealt with, instead destroying their board during the end phase of the turn. It can't even be used proactively as an interruption like Absolute Zero, since it requires your opponent to get rid of Mirror Jade for the effect to trigger. So, with that being said, why is Mirror Jade so much higher on this list than Absolute Zero? Well, being generically usable in any deck willing to play Branded Fusion certainly helps, as you can either use Branded Fusion from the hand to special summon out Lubelia and the Searing Dragon, to then summon out Mirror Blade using it and Albaz's material, although you'd be locked into fusions for the entire turn, even before you use Branded Fusion. Or alternatively, a lot of non-branded decks like to use Branded Plant Verte Anaconda in order to fuse it with Albaz in your deck in order to summon Mirror Jade, and because Verte Anaconda only copies the effects of cards and not their restrictions, you can also do any kind of combo, like Link and Synchro Spam before going into Verte to make Mirror Jade, which made it a very easily accessible boss monster that any deck could make, provided they could summon out two effect monsters for Verte. However, now that Verte Anaconda is banned, it's definitely become a lot less accessible for most decks that aren't centered around Branded Fusion specifically. But other than its ease of access, the real strength of Mirror Jade is actually because of how its effect is timed. One key weakness of Elemental Hero Absolute Zero is that once the effect has been used, your opponent could simply start building their board again after dealing with Absolute. Or alternatively, if they have a Raigeki in their hand, they could simply out Absolute Zero before committing any monsters in the field, making this effect worth a lot less, as your opponent can now build up their board without repercussion. But in this same scenario, if Mirror Jade is out with Raigeki, its effect will trigger to destroy all monsters during the end phase. So in this instance, because Mirror Jade's effect will resolve during the end phase, whatever field present your opponent managed to acquire will be wiped out, and if they didn't happen to have a negate to deal with the effect by the time Mirror Jade was sent to the graveyard, then there's no way to negate the effect during the end phase when it resolves. This is because Mirror Jade's effect doesn't activate during the end phase, it just resolves, in a similar manner to how Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforces effect to summon out a Destiny Hero from the graveyard doesn't activate during the standby phase, it just summons it in the same way as Cyber Dragon does. Making Mirror Jade's Raigeki-like effect difficult to play around, since you need to set up a negate for its Raigeki-like effect before you out it, which is especially hard to while Mirror Jade still has the ability to banish as an interruption, and shows why Mirror Jade is currently seen play as a generic fusion boss monster of choice, even over other generic and powerful fusion boss monsters like Red Eye Stark Dragoon and Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, landing it squarely at the number two spot. And crackling in at number one spot as the best Raigeki-like effect in the game is Lightning Storm. Lightning Storm is a normal spell with two possible effects depending on which you choose when you activate it. You can only activate it if you control no face-up cards, and when you do, you get to choose between either destroying all attack position monsters your opponent controls, or destroying all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. Now, strictly speaking, if Lightning Storm only had its first effect, it'd actually be considered much worse than Raigeki. As unlike Raigeki, Lightning Storm is conditional and can't be used while you control any face-up cards, it is only once per turn, and furthermore, it only destroys face-up attack position monsters, meaning that your opponent can easily play around Lightning Storm by simply putting their boss monsters in defense position, just like with Mirror Force. But, Lightning Storm having the ability to either be a Raigeki or a Harpy's Feather Duster to destroy all spell and traps that your opponent controls gives Lightning Storm a level of adaptability that no other card on this list can match. And while its ability to destroy all of your opponent's monsters isn't as good as Raigeki, Lightning Storm is going to be more useful in more situations due to its dual ability, making it an effective board-breaking tool whether your opponent is playing a combo deck or a trap deck with lots of floodgates. Whereas with either Raigeki or Harpy's Feather Duster, you have to hope that you've drawn the correct tool for the right situation, as Raigeki isn't useful when facing five set cards, and Harpy's Feather Duster can do very little against combo decks. Meanwhile, Lightning Storm can adjust its effect to deal with both of these scenarios, which is why, in the modern era at least, Lightning Storm sees a lot more play inside decks than Raigeki or Harpy's Feather Duster, 
since it can be used to break any kind of board and isn't limited to a particular niche. And just like Mirror Force, Lightning Storm has even changed how people currently play the game. When set into boards, it's now usually a very smart choice to have a boss monster with decent enough defense, like Baron de Fleur, to be put in defense position in order to play around Lightning Storm, so you don't have to use your negate to prevent your boss monster from being destroyed. Even trap decks like to think of Lightning Storm during games 2 and 3, where they usually side in cards like Anti-Spell Fragrance to play around both Harpies and Lightning Storm to prevent their macro from being destroyed. All in all, despite Lightning Storm clearly having a much weaker effect to clear your opponent's monsters, the fact it's so useful in so many situations rather than just to destroy monsters gives it the edge of a Raigeki and every other card on this list, and is usable by any kind of deck, making it the clear choice for the number one spot on this list. Alright, and that's the list. If you know of any other Raigeki-like effects we may have missed, or you have ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.